Okay. Um, the thing that I love about doing this podcast is learning in detail people's journey. And your footy journey is quite remarkable. So 10 different teams across four countries, two World Cups, two Olympics. And that on its own is a long form podcast worthy yet. But what has happened to you in the middle perhaps puts everything into perspective. Uh, and I'm hoping we could start there. I, I want to sort of paint the picture and then sort of get you to take it from there if that's all right. So yeah. it's 2020, you're 27 in your 10th year of being a professional footballer. The world's just gone into lockdown. You're playing for Melbourne City in the A-League and have just signed for Brighton in the Women's Super League in England when you notice a lump. Yeah, crazy. Um, I noticed a small lump on the right side of my neck. Um, I had actually felt it before, I think November the year before, and I was kind of like, oh, I'm doing too much gym or something, or a good excuse to get me out of gym. Um, and, but it had gone away, and so I'd forgotten about it. Um, and then, yeah, it came back in lockdown. And again, I was doing, like, home workouts, and I was like, oh, maybe I've annoyed it again or something. But then I was like, oh, might as well just get the doctor to check it. Um, so I went to see my Melbourne City doctor, and he was like, oh, let's just get a biopsy and a few blood tests and stuff just to make sure everything's okay. Um, and then, yeah, so I went and got those checks done and it was actually crazy I was at the bid so we were in front of the Sydney Opera House um getting like doing media and photos and stuff and then that's I was still waiting for my test results then and then I got a phone call from the doctor like literally while I was there and he was like oh there is something we think it's this Japanese thing called Kikuchi Fujimoto or something um it's harmless um but like, it's, it should be fine, but if it grows, just get it checked again. So I was like, what is that? And so I was, like, Googling and nothing really. Like, it wasn't anything. Um, yeah, and so I was like, okay, sweet. Like, it's it's fine. Um, and then I went over to Brighton and um, slowly just kept growing, kept growing. And then I was doing gym and I was like, oh, this can't be just from the gym. Um, and then the other side started to swell as well. And so... I've got these pretty big lumps on my neck and I'm like, this is not right. And so I'm trying to get um, get another doctor's appointment in England, see my uh, club doctor there and things move very slowly over there. Um, obviously, we we're just on the other side of COVID, so that complicated things as well. Um, and finally, I got in to see a GP um, and then she recommended me to go get another needle biopsy. So I'm like, oh just had a needle biopsy like what's this one gonna find anyway so when I was there um getting that done um I asked the lady who was doing it I was like oh what do you think it could be she goes oh I think this could be lymphoma and I was like oh I actually didn't know what it was <laughs> <laughs> so I go out um I'm like oh doesn't sound great so I went out to my car and I googled it and I was like oh crap that's uh -huh. cancer um probably a bit naive of me but um yeah so that's the first time I heard the words well not the words but I heard lymphoma um what do you do then after you've googled that and you've seen that what the doctor has said is likely it cancer could be, or yeah. it could be cancer like um, do you are you just processing do you, do you call someone straight away or do you sit with it for a minute I kind of was like a bit in shock I was kind of, I, I was out by my car and I remember like kneeling down and I was like looking at my phone like, oh my gosh, really? I'm 27. This can't be right. Um, and then, yeah, I talked to my closest friends and family um, and then obviously drove home. So I was on the phone. I was, it was kind of weird. Like, yes, I was like that to the very start. And then I was like, Okay, I don't know that it is that. I've just got to control what I can control at the moment. Um, yeah, it could be that, but we got to see. Um, and so that was the very start of it. And yeah, so I went back to the club and um, the physio kind of said, oh, how was your appointment? And I was like, oh, not that great. Like they said it could be lymphoma. And the physio goes, oh. It won't be lymphoma. Uh, they told me I had breast cancer once and it was nothing. Uh, 
And I was just like, okay, so when this turns out to be that, are you serious? Anyway, um, so that was that was kind of annoying. And then, yeah, I guess that's when the long process started. It took me a month to get those results, and then those results were inconclusive. And then um, I had to wait another, I don't know, three to four weeks to because they sent it for extra testing or something, and then again, go to the hospital. Uh, it's still inconclusive. We need to do these other tests. They put some weird thing up my nose and down my throat, and um, yeah, didn't find anything with that. And then they're like, okay, we need to cut into it, take a bit of the tissue, so I've got a big scar there now. Um, so that took another month to wait to get that surgery. Um, and then, yeah, so... Are you still playing at this point? Are you still training and playing, or is it a different? Is it a preseason part of the season? No, we were in season. Um, I was playing up until I had surgery. Um, is that weighing on your mind <laughs> while you're? Uh, I assume it. It must be like it's a very hard thing to put to the back of your mind and focus on performance. Yeah. Or did that act as a distraction away from it? I think it was probably a distraction. Um, the coach actually came up to me and said, because she obviously had heard that it could be that. She said, are you mentally okay to play? Like, are you okay to do this? And I was like, yeah, like, this is good for me to keep doing this. I need this distraction. I need to feel normal. Um, is that Hope Powell? Was she, yeah. was she the coach of that stage? Yeah, yeah. Hope Powell. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was good for me to keep playing. Um, but then it did get to the stage where I needed to get this surgery done and then... Um, yeah, it was crazy. And then I waited a whole nother month to get those results. And I'm calling up every week. I'm like, is there results? Is there results? And they're like, ah, oh, it's a bit hard to tell, but we it's cancer, but we're just trying to find out which type it is. And so as soon as I heard that, I was like, okay, get me on a plane. I was like, get me out of here. And obviously COVID, there were not many flights going to Australia where I'm, I was getting treatment. Um, and then finally, I think it was 24 hours, I was on this Facebook page um, and it was like travel agents trying to get people home. Um, I think there was 23 people on my plane and it was like, I think, 8,000 pounds for a one-way ticket. It was in business class, so that was good. <laughs> but um, it was one of those ones that, I think it was Singapore and it went and stopped in Singapore, but you couldn't get off the plane. So it was just in transit on the plane. So it was like, I don't know, 27 hours just straight on the plane. Um, Did the length of time that it took you to get that clarity that this is cancer, that three months or whatever it was, did that help prepare you for when you did hear? Because I guess you're preparing for two outcomes, right? It, mm -hmm. it either isn't and you get on with it or you're preparing yourself for that is and was that your plan the whole time? Yeah. Um, I think the worst part, to be honest, was waiting to figure out what it was because – Obviously, something's wrong. I've got these massive lumps on my neck, um, but I don't know what it is. I can't make it faster to get a result. Um, so that was the tough part. And I think once that nurse did say it could be lymphoma, that's when I think I started researching it and I saw that it was a decent like survival rate. Um, and... I figured out which ones are good to get, which ones are not good to get. Um, so I kind of knew more about it and I was more prepared. And so when I finally did get that um, diagnosis, I was it was more relief. I was just like, okay, cool. Yeah, this sucks, but I can get on with it now. I can get treatment and I can get better. Yeah, it gives you certainty about yeah where, where mm -hmm. your path is going. So you go back to Australia and it's it's a brutal year ahead right mm -hmm. how many can you talk us through what mm -hmm. yeah d basically as much or as little detail as you yeah. want to go into in the treatment mm -hmm. yep so i got to melbourne um i had previously talked to the doctors just online um and they'd said oh do you want kids and i was like what i got cancer why are we talking about Having kids. Inappropriate. Yeah. I know. <laughs> like, I don't have time for that right now. <laughs> um, I was like, oh, I haven't really thought about that lately. Um, and they're like, because obviously having chemo can really affect your fertility. 
Um, so I was like, well, yeah, obviously I want that choice. I don't want that to be taken away from me. So first thing was to get um, IVF. So I went in, I got a bone marrow biopsy. I had a PET scan. I had a whole bunch of tests. Um, and then obviously I started with the IVF, which I think that was maybe two weeks. I can't really remember. But pretty much you got to inject your stomach, get these hormones in um, to get you making these eggs. And then once you've got enough, they or when they're ready, I don't really know. They get them out and, yeah, just going to put it out there. I did really well. Yeah, I got sure 27 did. eggs. Good result. Wow. Yeah. That's good Because they say 10 eggs equals yeah. one baby. So I was like, wow, thank you. Yeah. Nicely done. Yeah. yeah. Um, Two and a half. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> done the maths. Yeah. I was really sitting there trying to, trying to take it through. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was good. Um, and then, yeah, so. Just pause you there. That's a hell of a double whammy to have to deal with in a short space of time because you're preparing for this one case and then you're getting slapped with this other case. Like what's your support network look like at that stage now that you're back home? Mm -hmm. um, so I was getting treatment in Melbourne. Um, the facilities are amazing. They're like, that was the best place for me. My family lives on the Sunshine Coast in Queensland. Sorry. Um, and so um, they would come up every couple of weeks when I would start my treatment um, for my cycles. Um, so their support was really good. Um, I have a lot of friends in Melbourne. That was, Melbourne's my home. Like that's where I can see myself living. Um, so I had a lot of friends and a lot of friends' parents, like my second family is there. Um, so yeah, all those people helped me out so much. But before you started the chemo, did you have an idea of what chemo was? Did you have a, uh, yeah, D did it, did it marry up to what you thought that experience was going to be? I had absolutely no idea what it's going to be like. I remember sitting there before my first chemo um, session, I guess, and I had to get there at like, I don't know, eight o'clock or something. And then I had like a half an hour, or an hour, like chat with the nurse and they were like, okay, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. And I was like, okay. And then I went straight in for chemo and I was like, this is crazy. Like that's the first time I had been told what was actually going to happen. And then half an hour later, it's happening. Mm -hmm. So it was a bit like, here we go. I'm not going to say it was exciting, but I was kind of like, what is this going to be like? Like, I don't know. Cause I mean, I tried to do a bit of research and I didn't really find out too much. Um, but I remember thinking, one thing was like, how is this gonna feel? Like when it goes inside, like is it gonna hurt? Is it gonna be like, make me feel awful all of a sudden? Um, so I was a bit like, Ugh, what's it gonna be like? But um, I would say actual doing the chemo, like going in for the sessions was better than what I thought it was gonna be. It was the side effects that came with it that were the crap thing. So. I was told because I had oh, lim oh my gosh brain because I had that's, um, that's a that's a genuine side effect oh though yeah. as well right is yeah. a bit of brain fog yeah does it still affect you to this day I think it does to be honest like my memory really sucks I'll go to say something and then I'll forget it like that um it was worse when I was going through it oh my goodness well I've listened Awful. to a few of your interviews almost straight afterwards and you can almost, I heard mm -hmm. you speak about that and you can almost hear yourself yeah. lose your train of thought 100%. and then try and bring yourself back. Mm -hmm. Definitely. It's definitely a thing. I think some people thought I was like, oh yeah, chemo brain sometimes. Yeah. But I was like, no, <laughs> actually can't do it. Um, yeah, so I had stage three Hodgkin's lymphoma, um, which meant I needed more intense uh, chemotherapy because it was lo below my diaphragm. Um, and so he was like, you will lose your hair. Like it's, it's more intense. Like your body's going to take a hit. Um, and then it was a 21 day cycle. So day one and two and three, I would go in for like the first day was the longest day. It was about five hours, six hours. And I had, um, three different types of chemo. One was called the red devil because I 
think that's the one that makes you lose your hair. But also, if you sit in the sun after it and you, like, get burnt, like, your veins go black. They kept telling me that. I was like, I'm not going in the sun. <laughs> really? It was crazy. Um, and those two were fine. The first two were fine. And then the third one, it was the longer one. And they're like, this one kind of gets people. And I was like, oh, my body's great. I'll be fine. And then about 10 minutes into it, my head just went. And I was just like, oh, like thinking about it now, it gives me shivers because it was such a like unpleasant feeling. And you just get like, they call it a head cold. Um, I, don't, I can't even explain it really. It's just not a good feeling. And then so they can slow it down and you, you just got to, I don't know, wait for it to, to finish and then you kind of feel better and stuff. What the, do you do during a chemo session to keep yourself occupied? Um, phone, watch a movie, um, I don't know, write notes or something. I, I remember one, one day my friend's a coach and um, she was like, oh, can you watch this game and give me some like feedback? And so I was doing, doing that and writing some notes and stuff and, and that was good. It made the time go fast. But to be honest, the best thing for me was Peckish. Do you know Peckish? No. Crackers. Yeah. They were so good. <laughs> Honestly, they got me through that half an hour of awfulness. Um, yeah. So that was day one. And then it was two and three were very quick days if you got in fast. Um, like literally 15 minutes for two, two um, different chemos and then you're out. Um, and then same with day three. And then you have, so that's one to three. And then day... I think eight or nine, I go back in and get another one, which was easy as well. And then I wait till day 21. That's the end of my cycle. So really I go in for four days of chemo. Um, and then, so yeah, I had six of those. And then the doctor told me I didn't need six. I only needed four. So I was like, yes. Yeah. That's, that's a good message to get. Um, before I get to that though, the mindset, like we're going to talk later about, you know, the incredible career you've had and the mental strength and, and why you're so likable in the team environment because of your attitude. When something like this happens and you're, you, you're going through rounds and bouts of chemo and you're facing death, right? Like, are you thinking about death? Are you thinking about mortality or are your mortality or are you just thinking about how strong you need to be and the positives and, and, and are you just sort of focused on, on how you're going to get through it? Yeah. To be honest, I never thought about death. I never... I was like, like that wasn't an option. Um, obviously, I saw the good um, survival rates and the doctor filled me with a lot of confidence as well. But honestly, after I researched it, I was like, I'm fine. This is going to be all good. I'll get through it. Um, so I didn't really think about that ever, which is interesting. The, the, there's, there's, brave, there's brave facing it, like, like you say, but surely during the period of your treatments, there are some really dark days and some really challenging days as mm -hmm. well. Who did you lean on or, or how did you get through those darker moments that um, that you, maybe you, you don't talk about all that often or mm -hmm. I know I know you did your blog stuff, which was really great and really gripping. Um, so, but how did you how did you fight those kind of dark mm -hmm. moments? Yeah, I mean, there definitely were the dark moments, 100%. Um, but I guess talking to people, that was my big one. Um, I had Steph Catley. She was on the other side of the world and she was amazing. Like I would call her when I was having problems and she was just a legend. Like really helped me. I think. I wish she helped us on this podcast. I reached out to her and she didn't <laughs> give me anything back. Oh, well, that's awkward. <laughs> <laughs> she would have had some real good stories. <laughs> um, yeah, but my family, they, they would come for my chemo days and they helped me out a lot. Um, and then the people I were living with, they were great. That's like my second family. Um, so definitely talking to people. Um, but to be honest, like one thing that I think really helped me get through it was distracting myself with Beat It, starting, starting that. Um, it gave me something else to do. And like I remember I was on steroids, so I, ha I was on a whole lot of drugs. And so these steroids, I think it was the steroids, they would wake me up at like 2 a.m. and I'd just be buzzing like I'm there like and my brain's just going 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 and so I'd have all these um thoughts about um beat it and I'd like get up write notes and do all this and it kind of like gave me a purpose away from football 
Um, so I think that was the biggest like help. For, for listeners that don't know, can you explain what, what Beat It is? Yeah. Um, so Beat It, I guess it started with my blog, um, just telling people about what I was going through, about my story. Um, and then I kind of had an idea that to make a cancer bag um, for people to take into hospital. So I was going to one of the early days appointments and with like a little shopping bag, like not very comfortable. Um, and I was like, no, I'm going through something so crap. I deserve better. I deserve to like treat myself. And I was like, I need a bag to put all my stuff. Like ugh, it was just ridiculous, like paperwork and tourniquet and just everything, drugs. Um, and so I was like, I'm going to make a bag. Why not? And so I started thinking how I could do that. And um, so I reached out to China. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I designed these beat it bags that were like purpose um, to take into hospital and hold all my medical stuff and drink bottle. Um, and then I was like, okay, how are we going to do this? So then I was like, what do I need when I'm going through treatment? And I was like, I need a distraction. I need food. I need my medication, tourniquet, paperwork, blah, blah, blah. So I made like separate like little, um, what do you call it? Departments for that, compartments for that. Um, and then, yeah, so it just kind of went from there. And then I was like, okay, I need to get these to people. So then I started an auction. I got heaps of um, footballers' shirts and from the Olympics, I think that was on then. Well, just about. Uh, auctioned them off and then raised a bit of money and then to pay for all this. And then we actually got them all out to Canteen. Do you know what Canteen is? Yeah. yeah. So they are in the process of giving them out to... Um, young adults, uh, young patients that are going through cancer. Wow. Yeah, so it's it's really incredible. And actually at the moment they are getting more bags sent over so that they can continue um, beat up by study bags um, and get them out to people who need them. That's so cool. Does it's, that it's fill you with really so cool. much pride that you've turned something which is so horrible and bad into mm -hmm. something so good? Yeah, it's so good. And I've been getting a few Instagram messages from people saying like, oh, I received your bag today. I'm so thankful. Like, it's perfect, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's not perfect, but <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's it's really cool to, to help people. So so the doctor says that you don't need to do any more treatment. You, mm -hmm. You're in the clear. Was it at that point that you think about getting back on the football field or was that, was that something that you were going to do mm -hmm. earlier? I mean, I I always thought, I'll be back to football. Um, I didn't know how soon it would be, but um, I was I was definitely the whole way through. I was like, yeah, I'm getting back. Like, I can't wait to be done so that I can get back to it. Um, but, yeah, I mean, when the doctor said, oh, are you, you ready for your last cycle? I was like, what? No, I've, I'm only halfway. And he's like, no, nah, you're pretty much in remission. Like, one more and you're done. And I was like... That, like that for me was the best moment, like the best news, um, because that that last cycle actually hit me quite hard. Like that was when I was at my lowest. Um, so I was so glad that I was done after that. I, I know you did the world's greatest shave, and it, I think part of the fundraising goes towards leukemia. Mm. Actually losing your hair, how confronting is that? <laughs> yeah, I was kind of scared for that, to be honest. Um, I had photoshopped a... Uh, a photo of me bald and the bald head that I had got was quite big and so I looked like an alien and I'm like I'm gonna look ridiculous this is not good like I was terrified um but yeah so I was like I need to make this at least kind of like fun and good and so I was like to like invited my friends and my family to like a salon and we kind of did like a wig party so everyone had to wear wigs except for me um and then they shaved it off and I think we raised around 40,000 or something to go to the Leukemia Foundation, which is incredible. So much support, it was, it was amazing. Um, but then like once they actually shaved it off, so I think I went to maybe that short, but I loved it. Like, I think we did a mullet in the middle of it. And like, once it was gone and I actually saw myself, I was like, okay, I don't look too bad. Like, this kind of suits me, like this is fun. <laughs> Um, but then I guess when I did 
fully lose it and it was like all patchy and then finally shaved it off. Like, I was fine with it. It was actually like, oh, walk around the mall with no beanie. People, oh, it was funny. Like, the looks I would get, it was, it was kind of interesting. Like, people look at you with so much sympathy. I'm like, I'm fine. Don't worry. Because <laughs> when you eventually came back to the field for Berlin Lions, I think it was, you, you were rocking the full shaved head oh, at that stage, right? I was completely bald. Yeah. Had no hair, actually. It was great. This is this is a, an interesting one. Like, were you able to head the ball? Genuine question. Like, there mm. was no issues around, like, sensitivity of the skin or anything like that? You were fully... Yeah. Okay. No, I had this um, good uh, oat shampoo and conditioner, so, like, my head was fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, just before we get you back on the field, there's... Is there some super emotional phone calls when you get the message? Is it when you get the message from the doctor or when you have that last treatment that you're in the clear and how do you celebrate? Like, do you mm -hmm. celebrate that? Yeah. Um, I remember because I didn't start chemo that day until like an hour later or something. So I went outside to like a little parky area um, and I called my parents and I was like, I'm done. I only have to do this last one and I'm done. They were like, what? So like that was incredible. And then I called one of my closest friends and, and told her the news. And um, yeah, it was just the best feeling ever. Um, it was so nice. Uh, yeah. And then, and then, I go ahead. No, you go. And then what was the time frame from, from when you got that message to when you started training and then playing again professionally? Professionally. Or playing again at all. So the bullying game was very early. Like I had probably only been playing for training, sorry, for like two weeks. Yeah. If uh, that, you, if that. You, you still, in my really amateur, you still looked really sick in, in my eyes in that, in that game. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, it was only 10 minutes and I was still like making sure my heart rate wasn't going too crazy. So I finished treatment, I think, early June, around the 21st maybe. Um, and I would say I fully got back to like in Melbourne City training, I would say around September, October. That's but cool. even then it was like I was having issues. Like it took me a long time to build up and actually be okay playing. Like, I don't think I was, I was not in a good way throughout that whole season. Um, I got to the end of that season and I was, I was barely training. I was just playing. Um, and then the Australia tour happened. So I went to the US um, and then for my first game back for New Zealand, which was incredible. Uh, uh, I, sorry to interrupt, but I was, um doing a bunch of, watching a bunch of old clips and interviews over the last week. And that clip where you come on and it's your first game back and the two players come over and there's just a very brief little hug and there's just like so much meaning in that moment. It got me all emotional. Yeah. yeah. No, that was special. It was so cool. Um, yeah. It was one of the best moments ever. And then there's extra emotion added in that particular, I think it was the Iceland match. Because there's a US fan in the stands, Alison Gale, mm -hmm. and she's got a sign, and the sign reads, Go Stoddy, and thanks for helping me beat Hodgkins. That is a statement in itself, right? Did you realise the impact that you were having through your own journey? Kind of did, just because of the messages I were getting and the communication I was having with these people. Um, so it's a crazy story. Like, she had the same thing I did at pretty much the same time we were going through treatment on the other side of the world. Um, and so it was really cool. Like that was, that was so special um, for her to come to that game and us kind of have that moment, I guess. Um, she's actually coming in the World Cup, which is so cool. Amazing. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's so special and it, it's so cool to, to see how, I guess I have helped and inspired people and just helped them know that they can get back to football as well. Does that carry a little bit of a weight of burden or pressure with you as well to or once you've been through a cancer journey is it all just whatever I'm mm. just I just get to enjoy and to play football now I think it's more like that like what I have been through I think it kind of does put things into perspective and like 
I think like things are more important than football. Like, yes, it's a massive part of my life, but I think I've realized like life, like being happy and enjoying myself is, is so much more important. I want to read a quote now from uh, Rado Vidicic, who coaches Melbourne City men's side, but was at one point uh, your coach. In an interview just as you were returning to play, he said this, Rebecca Stock, that is the highlight of my coaching career. I've had 36 undefeated games with Brisbane Raw, and I've worked with Ange Postacoglu, coached Alessandro Del Piero, I've won the FFA Cup with Melbourne Victory, and now here with City, I'm part of a fantastic organisation. But to be part of someone's life journey, to defeat the illness that she has had, to come back and to see her, how dedicated she is to the sport, to the women's game, and how much following she has got and how much people adore her, I think for us, that is the winning season. If we don't achieve anything else this year, just by helping her to get back on her feet and to achieve whatever dreams that she has in front of her, I think that is the winning right there. Is that the coolest quote? It is cool. Ever. No, I remember seeing that and I was like, wow, like that itself puts it into perspective. Um, so it's cool. I'm actually surprised there's no sweetie in that though. <laughs> he would just call us sweeties at training. <laughs> Ridiculous. But no, it's it's so nice. and yeah. I, I imagine something like that helps put it into perspective for you because you're just on this journey. You're, you've just had this thing thrown at you and you're fighting through and you're doing everything you can to get to the other side. And the people that you inspire along the way and you hear someone like Rado saying such powerful words about you and we're going to read some other stuff out later of the impact you have through the strength of your journey mm -hmm. it, it's just yeah it's, it's really inspiring yeah um it is crazy like i'm just going along with every day like i'm not thinking about that and then when does someone does say something like that it kind of does hit me and i'm like whoa i've been through that yeah i i, I wondered that i wonder if is it now more just forward facing? Like I know it's important to reflect back on what you've been through and there's lessons to be learnt from that journey as well. But when you go through that, I imagine you do just look forward to kind of every opportunity that's in front of you and, and rather than reflecting on the difficulties, the opportunities that now present themselves to you. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes I forget about it, to be honest. Like, I mean, what, it was three years ago now? Two years ago now? Um, so sometimes I do forget about it. Um, which is, is nice, I guess, in a way. But I definitely am, like, forward thinking and just thinking about the future. Yeah, look, uh, we're going to move move on. But what is your relationship like with the telling of this? Because every interview you do that I've listened to, it forms a big part of it. It's obviously a big part of our preparation. Is that something that you enjoy talking about in every interview or, or do you look forward to a time down the line where it's a, it's a minor it's a more minor part no I actually enjoy talking about it um I think it is good to reflect sometimes and actually go through it the story again like I don't mind it at all um I think there definitely will be a day where I get sick of it and I'm like okay <laughs> I'm over that let's not talk about it again but um I do like talking about it I don't know why it's weird like I, I, my mum had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, um, so going through the research of this has been a little bit challenging for me because mm -hmm. you, you're taken back into a place that you don't. It's it's filled filled with some kind of uncomfortable moments, but one of the things that shone through was thinking about the support that you had, but also thinking about the amazing people that work in oncology. They are just phenomenal, phenomenal humans, and you don't realise how much you can lean on strangers sometimes as well when you're in those mm -hmm. those uncomfortable moments. But they're just beautiful humans that work in those departments. And they're absolutely worked into the ground. They are incredible. The nurses, oh my goodness, they're the best. Do you ever go back to any oncology wards for visits or anything like that yourself? Um, it's been hard because I've been in Brighton. Um, but I do have three-month checkups. But to be honest, like you don't really get to see the people who were around you through chemo um so yeah you don't really get to see that but i see the doctors 